Let's look at John 21. Now I'm going to go 15 to 22. Now let's just begin reading. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. And when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Father, I ask to make alive the word. Give me clarity. Boldness, liberty to deliver the word. I give us hearing ears. May it touch hearts, change lives to the glory of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to give a backstory to this. We know Peter is the outspoken one. Who can identify with Peter? Yes, I can. <laughs> Constantly putting his foot in his mouth. I'm telling you, Peter, though, was a man that really thought he loved Jesus. If you go back where Jesus begins to tell them, now listen, there's coming a time they're going to come for me. When they strike the shepherd, they're going to, they're, you know, they're going to scatter the sheep. And Peter, he was bold. He told Jesus, you know, Jesus, others may deny you, but I'll never deny you. He said, you know what? I'm willing even to, lie, to lay my life down for you. I will die for you, Jesus. I love you that much. And it all sounded good, but you know what? You know, Jesus told him these words. You know, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And after you're restored, I want you to rise up and strengthen your brethren. He was predicting he'd fall away. In fact, he told Peter, Peter, I'm going to show Jesus had a smile on his face. You say you'll never deny me. You say you will die for me. But before the cock crows, has anybody lived in the country? You don't know about the rooster crowing at the dawn. If you've been some of the mission trips, you get woken up with it. Sometimes you feel like rooster stew for that, that day because everything wakes you up like at 4.30 in the morning. What's wrong with you? But Jesus said, you will deny me three times. Before that happens, that rooster crows. And Peter remonstrated, that'll never happen. Not on my watch. Let's fast forward. They take Jesus, begin to beat him and buffet him. They take him to the courtyard of the chief, uh, the high priest, and Annas. And they beat him. And they mock him. And I'm telling you, it's not getting good in what they're, what they're doing to Jesus. So Peter is there. You got to give him credit. He followed along with the Apostle John into the courtyard. So he thinks he's really tough. But then he sees what's going on. He can see, you know what? They really are going to kill him. And so a maid looked in his face as he's warming himself by the fire. And by the light of the fire, she looks at him and said, wait a minute. You're one of them. You know what his answer was? I tell you, I don't know the man. He denied him once. Another man came along and said, you're from Galilee. Your speech betrays you. He says, I don't know. Another sister comes, you know what? You are the one. You are one of them. And the Bible says, out of every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all cover it. 
he begins to swear and to curse, saying, I don't know the man. Luke 22, 61 is one of the most moving verses you'll ever see in the Gospels. The Passion lays it out correctly because I believe Jesus was, more, was, was walking when this happened. He's moving out of the courtyard because they're going to take him. And there's Peter. And the Bible said, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine the look? Can you imagine Peter? And the Bible said Peter remembered the words of Jesus. And he wept bitterly and ran out. So here's Peter, the one who was bold about what he would do. He even took a sword and tried to kill the high priest's servant. And he missed because he ducked, but he cut off his right ear. The last miracle ever that Jesus ever performed on earth was of putting the ear back on the servant's head. So here we hear, that's the backdrop. Think about how Peter felt. Because he loved Jesus, but Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You better pray that you enter not into temptation. That's a word to all of us. You'll want to had better be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit because your flesh can have you go against Jesus. You know what? We've all done different kinds of denying of Jesus. When you do something that's against God and knowingly do it, that's a type of denying of Jesus. We look at Peter, he was a failure. But this story is a one of restoration through the failure. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, it talks about the, the, the way Jesus appeared to people. He appeared to 500 all at once. He appeared to the 12. But then the Bible says in that same verse, the first one he appeared to, he appeared to Peter by himself. I love Jesus because he's kind. I love him because he understands humanity. And so there was a time, we don't know when, but Jesus had to appear to Peter one-on-one. -on -one. I promise you, Peter fell down and begged his forgiveness. And I'm sure Jesus began to restore him. Jesus appeared first to the ten disciples, because Thomas was missing, and all of Judas had, was, had hung himself. The second time he appeared, eight days later, and there were 11 disciples. Thomas was there. So this is the third time he appears. There's seven of them. Peter has told those guys, let's go fishing because they don't know what's going on. Think about this. Your leader's gone. I thought about this and studying this. They may have thought about the economics of it all. How are we going to survive? Well, we know fishing. Let's go fishing. Let's catch some fish. So the Bible says they went all night. They fished all night. There's nothing more frustrating. I've been there where you go to another place to fish. You don't catch a thing. They were tired. They were frustrated. At the beginning of the crack of dawn, as the light begins to glow across the sky, they're about 100 yards off from shore. Jesus is there. He yells out, hey, guys, have you caught any fish? Their answer, no. Hey, throw the net on the right side. Who is this guy? <laughs> you know, they're frustrated. They're angry. The light's coming now. The reason you fish at night, because I've been to the Sea of Galilee, it's crystal clear. You put a net in the water, the fish go, there's a net, don't go there. That's why they fish at night. So out of frustration, I promise you, well, what the heck, they threw it overboard. And to their amazement, 153 large fish came onto that net. It was so big, they couldn't even get in the boat. They had to drag it. And then all of a sudden, because you look at Luke 5, this happened once before to Peter. John, the apostle, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, you can see Peter's action. He didn't wait around. He didn't wait for the boat to be rowed to shore. He was hungry to see Jesus. He wanted to show him that much he loved him and that, think about his heart. So he jumped in the water and swam to Jesus. And then when Jesus is there, he says, bring the fish on board. And 
when they all came out to the shore, all of a sudden, here's Jesus. He's always serving. Wherever you see Jesus, he's always serving. Let this be a clue. He's a servant of all servants. There's a fire there with fish on it. I have been to this lake of Galilee. They've got a, a and they call it St. Peter's fish, which is a glorified form of tilapia. <laughs> and they had a small, and they would cook them over coals, just like Jesus did. They're coals. They're cooked over coals. And so when I go to Israel, I'll take you there. We will go to that restaurant right on the lake, and we'll eat just like they did. Blackened fish. It's blackened. But it is so delicious. We don't, we don't cook it like they cook it. But Jesus had coal and he had fish and he had bread. But Jesus always look, is looking out for them. He, he knows they're frustrated. He knows they're upset. Then he knows they're hungry. So they're eating this fish. You kind of wonder what they were saying if they're saying anything. Like how do you start the conversation? You having a good day? Where have you been? We miss you. It's been three and a half years together. We've missed you. Don't forget, he was, showed himself alive for 40 days. So this is somewhere between 8 and 40. Then he says to Peter, Peter, get up. I want, you, I want, I want, I want to talk to you. They began walking. We know he's walking because they said John was following. He said, uh, Peter, do you love me more than these? It's a slight rebuke. You said at one time that you would stand with me and you are better than the rest of these guys. Do you really love me more than these guys? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. In the Aramaic and the Passion, it's huba, H-O-O-B-A in Aramaic. And this is how it translates. Do you have a burning love for me, Peter? But Peter's a humbled man. It's not the same Peter we heard before he denied Jesus. Because don't forget, Jesus prophesied, you'll deny me three times. So he doesn't come across with the same intensity. He said, Lord, I love you affectionately as a friend. I really do. He says, if you do, then feed my lambs. Who are the lambs? The lambs are the newborns. They've just come to the kingdom. I need you to feed them. Then he asked the second time. Again with the same, do you, do you have a burning love for me? The actual Greek is agape. Do you, do you love me supremely, intensely? Do you have that kind of love for me? Again, Peter just had to back down because he was real. He said, Jesus, I affectionately love you. I love you as my friend. He said, then tend my sheep. To tend a sheep is different than feed the sheep. To tend a sheep is to guard it, guide it, protect it, defend it. I need to take care of my sheep. He's prophesying the fact that he would lead in the body of Christ. And in 1 Peter 5, 1, he says, shepherd the flock of God. The precious sheep have to be shepherded. Jesus set me up for this. So then Jesus, out of his grace, his mercy, his kindness, the third time, dropped down to Peter's level. He said, Peter, do you love me as a friend? And he said, grieve Peter. For the third time, Jesus kept asking him. Because the sting of the fact that he denied him three times had not been totally erased. He said, Lord, you know everything. Like, like you, you know what he's saying? I, de I denied you when you told me I would. I denied you. I didn't think I would, but you prophesied it. So I know you know everything because he says that. You know everything. I'm in a place where I don't even know myself. You know me better than I know me, which is true about God and you. God knows you better than you know him. He knows your end from the beginning. He knows all your weaknesses and, and your strengths, your failures, and yet he loves you unconditionally. The love through this passage is just amazing. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you as a friend. Then he says, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. 
Then he goes on to prophesy something which sounds strong. He said, there'll come a time when they'll stretch out your hands. And that's how the Romans did it. They'd take a big old beam behind you if you're going to be crucified. And history says he was crucified. They stretched out his hands, tied him up, and he had to walk to his own crucifixion. And they'll take you where you don't want to go. The church father's origin, Tertullian, they would write and say, he refused to be hung up like Jesus, so they hung him up upside down. But here's the good news and the bad. Jesus prophesied that he knew he would finish strong. Jesus, with foreknowledge, he looked down for the future, says, Peter, you may have failed me in the past, but that's past. For three times I've said you love me to make up for the three times you denied me. But I'm telling you, you will finish strong, Peter. Which tells me no matter what you've been in life, wherever you've done in your failures, God can restore you into ministry. That's the kind of Jesus we serve. He's a restorative Jesus. And then, you know, he goes on and he said, just follow me. So he turns and looks at John. What about him? Oh, he's so human. Jesus said, you know what Jesus said in, 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 in a nutshell? It's none of your business. Everyone's destiny is, you know, be careful you don't criticize other ministers. Be careful you don't criticize other people. Because they are servants of God, those who work. Just leave it alone with God. If you run your mouth, not good. Not healthy. He says, none of your business. You follow me. Because everyone has a unique calling, a unique destiny. And we cannot dictate to somebody what their destiny is. They must find it on their own. The Spirit of God will reveal it to them. But what you get out of this is the unfathomable love that Jesus has for Peter. But you'll notice something. He has this question. Do you love me? We're quick to say, oh, Lord, I, you know I love you. Throw on a free hallelujah. Maybe praise the Lord. But he says, if you say you love me, I have a job for you to do. Their sheep need to be tended, fed. I need you to step into helping me, Peter. I need you to step into ministry, Peter. I need you to step into serving, Peter. Listen, Peter, if you say you love me, then you must show me. You must serve me. If you say you love me, your service to the body of Christ reflects your heart of love to me. So Jesus posed the same question to every single one of us this morning. Do you love me? Let's talk about this a minute. What does it take to follow Jesus? The first thing it takes is complete surrender to him. You can't hang on to your own desires and will. I'm telling you, it's all about getting your will out of your, well, I want, I want, God said, no, no, wait a minute. Surrender means you yield to what he wants you to do. You know, the Garden of Gethsemane means it's the place of crushing. They take olives and they crush it. And they also got to take the pip out because the pip gets in the way. You know what that pip is? It's our little will. Now, I want what I want, when I want it, where I want it. Now, God, if you can, I'll accommodate you as long as you fit into my criteria. But God said, no, no, if you, I want to get the oil out of you, the life of God out of you, you need to take the pip out. And surrender is all about allowing God to take all of you. You got to be all in. With Jesus, if you want his blessing, you got to be all in. Everybody say all in. All in. That's our theme today is all in. You got to be all in. And what's so sad is in 2004, Brother Oral Roberts had a vision of America. And Jesus told him that America is not ready for his second coming. And Jesus told him, he said, most people in America go to church for what they can get and for not what they can give. People looking here, but I don't like the color. Myrtle, the color's not quite right, is it? I think they're singing too long, too loud, too short. Uh, the preaching is this or that. And we're always judging everything, but really what God said, would you quit judging? Would you just come to help? 
It's not easy running a Holy Ghost church. It's not easy running a Holy Ghost church with diversity of cultures. It's not easy with everyone has an opinion. They come running to me, Pastor, this is what you should do. You need this speaker. You need to do this. You need that. I say, you know what? I appreciate your input. I'll take you to the Lord in prayer. But I will not be pressured. I will not be battered around, beaten up to be doing what you want to do. Really, everybody wants you to do what they want to do. And I found out about people. I love people. They don't want you to do everything. They say, oh, Pastor, we don't stand. You're a busy man. You, you can't do everything. We're just asking you to do our thing. <laughs> Could you just do our thing? And so it goes. But we love people. So we got to understand that we got to look at this thing called Surrender, and I found my newest translation I love is the Good News translation. It says this in Romans 12.1, a different way, a different spin on Romans 12.1. So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy or his great love to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. True worship is supreme love. True worship is ador, uh, uh, giving God adoration, devotion, and just expressing it. But true worship, true worship is not just entering, entering into the worst place with your words, but with your life. What is it? With my service to God. I will show God how I love him, how I serve him. Because of his love for me. And it must be by love. You cannot serve out of legalism or guilt. The only way to serve him is out of love. Any other way will dry up. You'll get a dry spring. Then you'll get mad at me, mad at the church, and leave. I tell you, all that church wants you to do is serve. No, you can begin. You can end. I had someone preach. Uh, I just had last week they, two of the couples, uh, Ted Furness and Lorna. Uh, they were, Ross, they were both here. Both served one 16, 17, another about 12. And, you know, you can begin, you can end. Some go work here, but, but here's the deal. You've got to keep serving because it's in the serving that the life of God flows out of you. It's in the serving that's where, it's in the giving out that you begin to give God the worship that's due him. Are you out there? It's so important. And so we do it out of love. God loves me. For, there's no greater love than a man can show a friend than to lay down his life for us. Jesus laid down his life for us. There's no greater value God has given us. The fact that God sent his only begotten son and had his blood spilled for you. That should always touch your heart. 1 Peter 6, 20, you're bought with the price. What's the price? The blood of Jesus. Jesus had to buy you out of devil's prison house. And it was only his blood that got you out. It's amazing. Once we get out, we throw the key away and say, woohoo, I'll be good. Jesus said, wait a minute, I need you to help. Now listen, let them take care of themselves. I'm good. I hate to say it, most of the church is that way. In fact, if I gave you the, the statistics in America, America is where it is because the church is very sick. It's sick, it's not healthy, it's sick. Three to five percent of the people even give their money. That means 95, 97 percent don't, they tip God, they don't give to God. Because people get confused. It's amazing. You have a you have PhD in math, and all of a sudden, when it comes to tithing, your mind goes, eh, What is it now? It's, it's so confusing. Is it uh, Old Testament or New? I don't understand exactly the tithe of what. I'm just, uh, yeah, 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 well, I got to wait till I figure it out. What? It's so hard. Let me give you simply you take the decimal point or whatever number there is. And you move it to the left one space. Is that nice? The dot over one. And there's the tithe. Ta-da! You don't even need a calculator. You can do this thing. If I'm standing on your toes, I'll stand a little while longer while the Lord ministers healing to your life. I promise you. But when it comes to service... The figures are abysmal. You know, there are mega churches in our city that cannot even staff their own big events with their own people. They call us. They, we we want to hire you. What now? They put on the front of the mega church. You're going to do what now? 
We want to hire you. For what? To get your people. Can you give us 20, 30, 40 people to work our big event? What? You can't even get enough people out of your big church? No. You know what? On principle, no. I don't want to be attached to that kind of weak church. You may be big, but you're flabby. I'd rather have a lean, clean, gospel-fighting machine where people are serving God. And our stats are very good in this church. A huge percentage serve God and give out to God. I'm very proud of this church. I mean, so, yeah, you give yourselves a hand. Praise the Lord. Okay, now quit. It's not that great. You know what? We need to be 100%. We are not going to really clap until we get everybody on board. Because what happens is this. When you don't do your part, then someone else is going to take up the part you won't do. So we have, you know, the Pareto principle is that 20% of the salesmen sell 80% of the product. It's always 20-80 in life. It's the few that do the most. It's the same in church. It's the few that give out the most. It's the few that give the money. It's the few. I mean, it's like... You can actually take the 20%, make a new church, and kick the others out. Just say, listen, we don't need you. We got the 20. (laughs) You're just baggage. No, no, we don't do that here. Please, that's tongue-in-cheek. If you're a first-time guest here, please, I have a little levity just to help this thing go down a little easier than you may be wanting it to go down. But you understand this, that there is not a place for a church not to be, every member should be doing something. Because Jesus asked a question for every member. Do you love me? Yeah. And everyone say, of course I love you, Lord. Then you've got to understand. You've got to do some feeding of sheep, tending of sheep, and feeding of lambs. It's involved. He needs you. Jesus needs you. And so what happens is not everybody's totally surrendered. But let me give you the scripture out of Romans 6, 13, out of, the, out of the good news. It said, all those who have been bought from death to life, that's everybody, and surrendered your whole Being to him, to God, you're to be used for righteous purposes. God wants us, it's a big challenge, to give you all to him. He wants to use your life. Well, I don't know about that. There are three barriers why we don't give everything to God. Number one barrier was fearful of commitment. We're afraid. What's it going to cost me? How much time is this? Does that mean I'm responsible? No one wants to be responsible. We teach responsibility here. Our church, we hot bunk. What's that? In the military, you go on a submarine or in the Navy, they don't have a bed for every person. They have three shifts. You get the bed for eight hours. So when you get to your bed, the guy gets out, does his shift, and you get in his bed. That's why it's hot. It's called a hot bunk. And when you get out, it's hot for the next guy. We do that in this church. We hot bunk. Every room. I, I, I look at these mega churches sometimes. I look at their rooms. I said, this room is for the women's auxiliary. And they meet once a month. Or once a week. Big rooms. One hour a week. We don't do that. We have a planning center here. You can ask any of my staff. We hot bunk. I'm telling you what. You got one person coming in. I mean, coming in, the other guy's going out. So because we have so much stuff going on all around the campus all the time, we train our people. Your mama don't work here. Your mama don't live here. If you mess it up, clean it up. You drag out the tables, put the chairs up, trash the floor, put the tables back, the chairs back, and vacuum and clean it up. Why? Because the next person's coming in. I've got two full-time maintenance men, another two or three part-time people, and they go 90 miles an hour and still have a hard time keeping up. So we would drown them if we all just throw out there the table and just leave with the trash. We don't do that here. How many know how that's how we roll? Because we train you. Your mama don't work here. And so we got to understand that God needs you, that this surrender is big. But, but the three barriers, number one, fear. Number two, pride. It takes humility to serve. 
And if you may have a degree, uh, do you know, realize who I am? <laughs> no, who are you? I am Dr. Blah, 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 blah. I have these, I'm worth so much money. You don't say. Oh, I'm Mr. So-and-so. You want me to what? Usher. What? Uh, could you serve the children? What? Do you know who I am? I'm important. I'm busy. I'd like to say, sir, let me explain to you. Um, there's some people a lot more wealthy than you that have exhi exhibited Christ-like service. Number one, craft with craft cheese. I'll throw just a few. Uh, J.C. Penny. Uh, Truett Cathy, Chick-fil-A, the chicken man. All three of those, I can go down the line. Here's their testimony. Even though they were the richest people and the most successful, they all served every week in their church. True, Kathy had a Bible study, Sunday school for teens till he died. So did Kraft. So did J.C. Penney. I can go down the line. Just because you are worth millions doesn't mean, uh, excuse me, <laughs> would you park my Bentley and... <laughs> And where's my front seat with my name on it? No, we need to be servants because here's the deal. God needs you. And it takes a surrender. It takes humility. You got to, it's fear, pride, and the last thing is confusion. Really, in all honesty, I listen to people, I don't know what to do. I'm here and I get frustrated. I'm trying to do. I don't know what to do. And they'll, and they'll spend month after month, I don't know what to do. I'm still seeking, waiting. <laughs> well, how long is this going to go on for in this confusion? You've got to find your place. And I've got a good solution. If you don't have a ministry you like, find a need in the house and begin to meet it. Find a hurt. Begin to heal it both within the house of God and outside. And one of the things I do, I don't tell this, I haven't told it for, but you don't need to know my stuff. But I have a special account, which I keep to give to people. Don't form a line, that, 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 <laughs> there's no line for this. But the Lord will move on me to help people. I will personally give them cash or money to bless them. I just do that because the Lord just moves on me. It's called the gift of giving. You realize we have people in this church that have helped other people, and they do it carefully. I told them. I had one wealthy man show up, and he began to give money out, and literally after church, a line formed. <laughs> Everyone had a sad sack story. <laughs> and then they would ask for the moon. One man had enough audacity. I'll never forget it. To come to the man's house, even in the Bible study, he said, I, I, I need some money. But what do you need? A million. <laughs> he just boldly asked you for a million? Yeah, he's real bold. I need a million. Um, when can I get it? <laughs> I said, send the man to me. We had what's known as a come to Jesus meeting. But you have different ministries. There are different ministries that, that are in the body of Christ. But it takes surrender. You've got to surrender your heart. You see, Peter got to the place where he wasn't a big shot anymore and he was humble. And, 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 and Peter was humbled by his own folly, so to speak. And uh, you've got to understand that Jesus needs you, but he can't really use you unless you say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. I remember when I was in church, I've always served, but it came an epiphany where I had a... At a meeting with Jesus, when I went before him, I said, Lord, I'm getting to see this now. You want me to be available for your service no matter what. He said, yes, son, that's right. I went to the pastor. I said, pastor, I just want to submit. I, and I was serving. I was on the worship team. I ushered. You know, I wasn't lazy. But I said, pastor, the Lord's given me a revelation. 
I am here to serve Jesus, whatever you need me to do. Very dangerous words. Use me in whatever you want me to do. Let's look at the pastor. He was drooling right here. He had a wipe. <laughs> whatever you want me to do? He started using it. He said, listen, uh, we need a, we need a, a, a Valentine banquet. Uh, could you head up? Sure. I knew nothing about banquets. <laughs> uh, so here, I, here was my rationale. What can I handle? Spaghetti and meatballs. I, can, I figured I can handle, sp you, how can you mess up spaghetti? I thought nothing about the romance. We don't really care. <laughs> I said, I'm, I got me a big old bowl. I put the salad, emptied the salad out. <laughs> got a bowl of salad. And then I got me some Italian bread, cut up. I just threw it out there. It was like in a row. And I had a cafeteria style. And I got these red and white chick uh, uh, tablecloths. Had them out there. I throw on some Italian music. I said, okay, the Valentine banquet has begun. Please get your food. I said, shove it out there. They came down. Please sit down. Please eat it. Have a conversation. I remember it was very, it was very military. Uh, <laughs> we got the food to the people. Okay, you may now go. I think I had them clean up for me. I don't know what it was. It was all I know was word got back to the pastor. Do not use him for any banquets. <laughs> okay, so they try different things on me, but I'm willing. I'm willing. But here's the deal. I found out through the process of elimination what I was good at and what would help them and what I was not good at, but I was willing. Do you know what my willingness has got me? Because I served and served and served and gave. Next thing you know, I was part of the staff. Next thing you know, for four years, I worked there as an associate. And next thing you know, I was sent to begin this work here. All by telling God, I'm willing to serve. Now, let me tell you about God. Some of you know you've got a mighty call of God on your life. But you believe your ministry is to hold down the chair every Sunday. <laughs> no, God made gravity for that. You don't need to hold down the chair. <laughs> but let me tell you how God's a good businessman. God's not going to promote someone that's not doing anything. I'm waiting on the Lord for my ministry. You'll wait there and you'll be beamed up and, you, and, and Jesus is going to say, you never did anything. I was waiting on you, Lord. No, no, no. I, no, I put you in a family of believers that needs all around, but you overweighted. Just begin. Just begin. But you should not come to a church on a regular basis without finding some place to serve. To do something. Are you out there? Otherwise, you're not connected to the body. So when you're going to surrender, as Peter had to do, you got to obey. And when God asks you to obey, many times it doesn't make sense to your natural man. It didn't make sense for Peter to hear, throw the net on the right side of the ship. But when he did, the miracle power of God showed up. It didn't make sense for Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees. To land he never knew. But thank God we wouldn't be here today if he hadn't done that. It didn't make sense for Abraham and Sarah to try to have children and he's 100 and she's 75. Give me a break. Well, 90. She's 90. 90. But God doesn't want to make, you know what? He doesn't want to make sense to your brain. He just says, do it. I don't know what, what I should do this. It doesn't make sense, but just begin it, begin it, begin it. And God will begin to open up doors for you. And you have to be able to say, Lord, it's not my will. In Jesus' name, but I'm going to learn how to obey you. That's why that song I just sang, Elisha Huffman, he said, is, the, is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Question mark. Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. So if you're going to say, I love Jesus, you got to surrender, but then you got to obey him as well. Everybody say obey. obey. Everybody say surrender. surrender. Everybody say obedience. obedience. Obedience means, here's what Jesus said in John 14, 21. If you keep my commandments and do them, you love me. You love God by doing what he asks you to do. And he's asked you to surrender your life and to obey his life. And the Bible says that we are all members of the body of Christ. 
That's out of 1 Corinthians 12, 14. The body of Christ has many members, it says. It's one body but many members. Everybody say, I'm a member of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, I love the way body, he uses it in, in, in 1 Corinthians. He said, is there anybody an eye? No. Is there anybody a mouth? No. Is there anybody an ear? No. But God has said, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 18, God has said, every member in the body, even as he is pleased. And so there's a portion that you're supposed to supply to the body. And what happens if you don't supply? Like maybe you're the leg, but you lay out. So the whole body's got to go without the leg. And then you're one of the eyes, but you bug off. I'm a, I'm a one-eyed <laughs> arg matey. And then the arm is broken. So you got another arm out. So you got this limping, struggling body, which should do so much, but it can only go so fast and so far because it's been incapacitated and brought down by people that say, I don't want to serve. You see, the needs are great out there, but we're limited to the people. Like Street Reach works. We had 18 at one time. Now we're down to 14. Just for, it's, it's not an equipment problem or a need problem. We have more places to go now than we have people to go to. My sister aside, we're going to see how it works out with the money thing. But she's got a heart for athletics after school. You can see it out there. Because when I met with the mayor, Lori Henry, like I met with every mayor, I always tell the mayor, how can the church serve you? We're not here to take. We're here to give. We have built bridges. We have built all kinds of done cabins. We've given them SWAT trucks, paid for a complete SWAT truck, built help with, us, with, the, with the city, and with our money, a quarter million dollar, we built three soccer fields right around the corner here. The church did that. So I went to her. I said, what's the biggest need? She says, my biggest need is this. Because of Roswell, especially in the apartment complexes, and the rent is so high there, the apartment complex, $1,300, $1,600 for an old apartment with one bedroom, it's ridiculous. And they are making $10, $12 an hour. And so the, poor, so the, the families have to work together. So the, the, the mom's there the, and the dad's there and they go at it. So it means most kids come home to latch door situations. And she said, the biggest need, we have so many children that can't afford after school. But if someone could help someone, it would be such a blessing. I said, you know what, we need to be looking at it. That was two years ago. But here's the sister says here, she's a professional athlete along with Sarah. And, you know, they said, we want to do something to do, and we will do it. We will, we will make it happen. After school athletic program. What if you got a coach around here? But anyway, uh, there's, it's just, but there's, but there's great need, but it's all going to take people. Who sucked the air out of the room? Who sucked the air? Put the air back. <laughs> It's okay. Breathe, breathe, breathe in, breathe out. Hallelujah. And so you got to obey him. Let me tell you this. Everyone has a part to play, and we're all a part of it. And I, and, and I just want to say this to you, that it's nothing, it's never legalism. Can I say this? When you begin to serve God, if anybody I've met, that I call them lifers. A lifer is when you make the transition where you get it. It's like the penny drops. You don't need to be encouraged. You don't need to be, you know, you, you need to serve. It's just that I'm going to do it because the vision's in me by God. I would not do nothing in a church no matter where I went. I have to do something. It's just within me to do it. I cannot sit because if I sit and soak, I will sour. I have to understand I was saved to serve. Salvation also means servanthood. They would not two separate things. They're one and the same. If you love Jesus, you will serve him. If you love Jesus, you will give to his body. If you love Jesus, you'll give your life away to help others find God. If you love Jesus, well, I love Jesus. No, 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 no. He's got a test. Do you love me? He told it to Peter. And not out of condemnation. or guilt. It was that tender love that I could see Jesus with tears in his eyes. Peter, I love you. Do you love me? Peter says, Lord, I love you. That's all God wants out. Lord, I love you. Show me what I need to do. Which brings me to my third point, which is so important to get because 
This is the people struggle with this. Discovering what I'm supposed to do. If I ask you a show of hands, don't raise your hand. Would you like to know what God wants you to do? I really believe that's a bigger problem than the fear and the humility. It's more like, what? What? Can I help you? Come next week. That's a joke. We got it right now. We're going to do it. First of all, you got to understand that it's so vital you connect it to the local body. If you're not part of a local body, don't be a church hopper. I'm checking this church. I'm checking that church. Some people check the churches for years. What are you doing? Still checking churches? You're still checking churches? I'm, try I'm trying to find the perfect church. Please don't join. You'll ruin it. I'm just, just, just trying to find the perfect church. My God, there's no such thing as a perfect church. Find a church that you can bear witness with. Amen. Hallelujah. That has your passion and follows your heart. And then the Bible, it says, because, let me tell you this. Without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life's got no meaning. And without meaning, life has no hope. Jesus gives you meaning. He gives you, he gives you purpose. And it's about exalting the body of Christ to reach the nations of the world. And everyone has a part to play. Everyone say, I have a part to play. And so you got to be very determined that you are going to focus your life. It, when you become, when you become effective, when you become selective, it's like you can't do everything, but focus on something God has given you to do and do it consistently. For whatever period of time God tells you to do it. You were made to serve God. Ephesians 2, 10, out of the, God, out of the good news says, God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds which he has already prepared for us to do. Amen. Amen. So here's the, so we are bought with a price. Somebody got to say, God, what do you want me to do? Now, I want to do some help with you. Ask yourself this question. What is my passion? What do I love to do in the help of others? What's your favorite thing? What are your interests? God will use that. What's your experience? What's your past experience? What have you experienced? That's part of the package. My experience is I grew up in Africa. My parents were missionaries. Duh. I love missions. That's my experience. I got it honest. Well, what's your personality like? If you're an IT person living in a cubicle, you may not be the most personal person. I wouldn't put you as a greeter. You can fix the computers. Amen. If you get the wrong person in the wrong place, they can drive people away. Maybe you're a choleric choleric. Can you imagine that? You're bossing people in the party. You, get over there. I said you get over there. <laughs> well, sir, don't ask. Don't answer back. Get over there. I've had people like that. I had to get them out. I had a person come back red face all the time. They get me so mad. Red face. I'm towing them off the lot. I said, sir, you need to get off this ministry. <laughs> this is not your ministry. This is not your gifting. Your personality is all not... It's not going to work, sir. It's not going to work. <laughs> but you know what? I found out this. You ask yourself the questions. You just make yourself av available. Then begin and then follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. God will begin to drop in you. And then you get, I, I, I promise you, you feel the rhythm. Feel the rhyme. You'll just be able to, you know, put that egg in there and away you go. But uh, that's a joke on the cool runnings. <laughs> But you'll find out what it is. I promise you, you'll find out what it is. Some people didn't think they'd like children. Kim Owens, I can talk to her about her because she's not here. <laughs> but Kim Owens says, I don't like children. Don't get me around children. I mean, well, could you help with the children? Well, I guess I will. As soon as she started doing it, she fell in love with the kids. Now you can't get away from children. She loves children. I mean, it's just as, it's just as you're going to find out what your gift set is. But let me say this to you. You, you cannot just sit there and say, I wonder what he wants to do. No, you got to move. God cannot steer a parked ship. Move. Move. Begin to do something. Find something that you can give out. Well, I don't see a ministry I like. Seriously? Make your own. Make your own. We make ministries all the time around here. Uh, pastor, I, well, fine. Go ahead. Do it. We'll get behind you in Jesus' name. But have a ministry. 
We have some ministries that just say, listen, if you're an, a, a retired lady and you can do something about your computers somewhat, you're good. We need help on times. We do big pushes. We need help in the office. We have many people who come help us in the office. If we do this athletic program, when we launch that, you can, you, you, you can help there. Well, there's so many areas to help in. There's no lack. You, do you like counseling? Do you like talking to people? That's not my cup of tea. I do it <laughs> until Sister Carolyn came along. She has a master's in, in talking to people. You get a degree in professional talking. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> and so you got to understand that Jesus looks at you as a gift to the body of Christ. Everybody say, I am a gift, am a gift. to the body of Christ. Body of I'm going to unwrap my gift <laughs> and give it away. Some of you got business that we need your help. Like I see Dr. Josh Uptergrove there. He's a blessing. He helps us. But one of my goals is to get some of the doctors just to be able to give away their gift to, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the, where, where do we go? No, not Liberia. No, not Tulsa. People. <laughs> Clarkston. Clarkston. My doctor has a clinic there for free. It's a free clinic. And, and medical people come offer their time, maybe an hour. We'll do something. Everybody should give something. Amen? And really, it should be something in the house and something that reaches the lost. You should really have two ministries, one that ministers here and one that ministers out there to get the rhythm going. You got to get the rhythm going. But, but can I just tell you what this happens when you, when you do this? There's a divine anointing. I'm telling you, joy will hit you. You'll experience the gifts of God become, begin to blossom out of your life. You begin to pour out things you didn't even know you had in you. And all of a sudden, your life gets full. I promise you, your life gets enriched. And you'll find your life just like taking off. And the very things you learn at church, you can turn and use in business. I have taken people that were proverbial wallflowers. <laughs> and when they come to church, they sit against it. And I put them in care ministry. And I trained them on how to care for people. Because the care, you got to reach out to the guest. And I had to break them out of their mold because they'd be against, they'd be glued against the wall. I had two or three of them. First day I ever had it going on. I'm out there doing my thing. I'm looking at it, and they're all like this. I had to have a training. After, after that, the next week, I said, no, listen, let me, let, me, let me train you. You go over to that person and you introduce yourself. No, no, you can, you can do this. They go, I would, I would coach them. I'm not making this up. They really happen. <gasps> Hello. My name is. I trained the second question. I mean the second statement. <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> you think I'm making it up? That severe. <laughs> My name is whatever. And then the third thing, drum roll, please. What? Whoa, 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 what can I pray about for your life? That wouldn't. That had to push it. I'm in sales background. Some people in sales, it's just a natural genuflect. Because if you don't do that, you'll be very skinny. Timid salesmen have skinny kids. <laughs> you just, you just, you just got to get out there. But we all have gifts. But I would watch them. I have watched people in our church break out of their shell, break the fear, break the timidity, and begin to become bold. And then a two months later, they're saying, hi, my name is so-and-so. What's your name? Can I pray for you? And next thing you know, they're leading a ministry. Next thing you know, they're in the prison. Next thing you know, they're leading street reach. Next thing you know, they're running their own mission trip. I've watched people evolve. And it happened in church. Church is a place that you can have your gifts that God gave you to expand. And it can work in the marketplace to bless you financially. It'll work in the marketplace to, to, to give you promotion. I tell you, I've watched church grow people. And that's what it's all about. So here comes the question I want to close with. It's the same question Jesus asked Peter. 
Do you love me? Will you serve me? Will you help me feed the sheep? Will you help me tend the lambs? It's a question. Only you can answer it. But do you love me? When you answer it, yes, then he'll empower you and equip you to go about doing what he called you to do. You will find your gifting. You will find your ministry. And you will flow for God. And the very flowing that, gives, that you give out to God will create who you really were designed to be in the first place. Would you bow your heads with me? In the name of Jesus. If you could play that song as you all on the altar laid as I look for my daughter who is nowhere to be found. I want you to go before God right now. I'd like you just to search your heart. I want you to present your heart before God on the altar of God. He loves you so much. He loves you. He doesn't condemn anybody. He just loves you. But as Jesus looks into your eyes, just see the the love he has for you. He says, do you love me? If you say, yes, Lord, I love you. Then he's asking you to surrender your heart to him completely. He's asking you to obey him. He's asking you to press into you find your gift and you find your you find the groove that God created just for you. There's more God has for you. But you're going to have to step out in faith and obedience. You have to step out in the unknown and do things that seem crazy to you, but God has a purpose for it. He wants a heart that's surrendered to his plan. You are created for great things. But there's none greater than helping the body of Christ grow, become strong, and reach the nations of the world for him. That's what you'll be judged on in, in, when you stand before Jesus. What did you do with your gifts I gave you to help the body of Christ? What did you do? Some of you are called to fund the gospel, to make money, to fund the gospel. Some of you to, are, to, are to help with children, disadvantaged children. Some of you are, are here to help young men be mentored that don't have dads. There's so many needs. So really you've got to go to God and say, God, I want to have my life totally in your hands. So I'm opening up the altar right now. The altar of God. But, but, but before I do, I just want to have this as a question. Are you here today? Do you have peace with God? If you're saved and you know it, that's wonderful. But if you are here today and you don't have peace with God, there are things in your life that are not right. You know it. He knows it. But today is a day that you can surrender your life completely to Jesus Christ. He will take away your sin. He will take away your guilt if you'll just confess that you need him. And be willing to turn from your ways. He will do the work. If you're here today, I want to ask you that one more time. Do you have peace with God? I'm going to have you pray right now, right where you are. That's you. Say, I don't have peace with God. Well, Pastor, would you pray for me? I need to know him. I want to know him. If that's you, quickly, just slip your hand up and say, that's me. I want you to pray for me, Pastor. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. I should help me out. Thank you. In the name of Jesus. All right, then I want to ask for those that are here today. It's not everybody, but I believe it is people here today. This altar I'm opening up. And I'm asking you to go inside your heart. And if you really truly want to consecrate your life afresh for the cause of Christ. 
that you begin to step into what he wants you to do. He will give you the grace to do it. He'll give you the empowerment to do it. He'll give you the strength to do it. And some of you don't even know what you should do. He'll give you the vision of what you need to do. But you need to make a step towards him. And so as we sing this song, God talks to you about this, and he said, yeah, he did. Well, then you need to get out of your seat and come stand by this altar as this song is given. Let your all on the altar be laid. It's between you and the Lord. But he will do a work in your heart by obeying him even now. In Jesus' name. Let's go ahead and sing it. Just come. Is your all on the altar? I don't know if I should go down there or not. If you feel a tug, let me say this to you. Just obey the tugs of God. Just obey the tugs. Obey the tugs. Obey the tugs. You say, no, I'm going to do this because I believe God has something for me to do. And I don't want to sit in the same place I am, have been for the last months or years. I really want to change. This is your way to step up and say, God, you're going to, I want to see you do it to me. Sing it one more time. Just obey the Holy Ghost. And those at the altar, just consecrate your heart afresh to him, even as we sing the song. Is your Jesus came with two things. He came to give, he came to serve. He came to give, he came to serve. When he says, follow me, that's what he expects you to do. You give for him and you serve for him. It's all about giving our heart to him afresh. Hallelujah. This is wonderful, this is beautiful. I want to pray for those who raise their hand to receive to get the peace of God in their heart. And I want to have everyone pray this prayer out loud. We'll take care of that first. Then we're going to take care of dedicating our life to Christ to get all he wants for us to receive his empowerment for the gifts to be released in our life. Everybody say this. Oh God, I want peace with you. And today I repent of all sins. I turn my back on sin and on the ways of the world. I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And Lord, I want to draw near to you today. And I believe you're going to draw near to me. And I ask you to send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon my life. Burn out all the chaff. Burn out everything needs to get out of my life. And touch you with your fire. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm saved, I'm born again, and I'm dedicated to Him. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer, you may want to slip up here yourself, but that's between you and the Lord. Okay, here we're going to go. I want you to raise your hands a little bit. I want everybody to say this out loud, but these people that are at the altar, I'm praying for you now. Father, you see each one standing here. You've touched them by your Spirit. God, you look at the work of the heart. Man looks at the outward, but God, you look at the heart. And Father, I believe there's a hunger in everyone here today to be used of the Lord. That they, wouldn't, that they would step into their gifts and callings and find the fulfillment and the freedom that comes in knowing you're doing what God asks you to do. Purpose and meaning comes into their life through this. I believe it, Lord. 
And so, Lord, whatever it's past failures, we buried under the blood of Christ, even as Peter failed, but let you use them to be the head of the church. I pray that the gifts of God in each and every person will be released in Jesus' name. I pray that every gift of heaven be released upon their life, that they would discover their purpose, they would discover their giftings, and they would release them for the body of Christ and for the world. And visit them, Lord, even now with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come upon them. Come upon them with fire from heaven. Let there be a new wind of God upon their life. Let the fire of heaven be on their life. Fire. I pray the fire of God on you. I pray that you burn with a passion for Jesus. I pray that you take more and more and more and more and more and more and more of the vision of Christ. He touches you. He emboldens you. He frees you to do what he's called you to do. You will no longer hold back, but you're going to run for God. I loose the gift of God in you. I speak the fire of heaven upon your life. I hear the Lord say he's given you great gifts. That you're a leader and he's going to make you. Take things and run with it. Today you're loose to go for God. You're going 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 to go for God. You are going to go for God. You are going to go for God like never before. Fire upon her life. Fire. Touch him, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Freedom comes to you. Fresh fire, fire, fire. You're all in. I hear this. I'm telling you, there's going to be like a double anointing coming. Fire upon your life. Fire, Priscilla. Asaba. Sibaroso, soboroso, tolo. Sadiala, babaradoso, tola. In the name of Jesus, the power of heaven covers you. Fire. 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 Sheila, mama. Use my sister for your glory, Jesus. Release your anointing upon her. You're going to be used mightily of God. God. You can just stay here for a minute. Let me just say this to you. This is a holy moment. Satan does not like this, but Jesus loves it. When you commit everything to God... You step into the miracle world of provision. When you go for God, I promise you, it's like the windows of heaven open over you and you step into a miracle provision, miracle protection. He is a God. You can never be shortchanged by Him. Whatever you give to Him, He will multiply and give it back to you. The secret to be blessed is obedience and surrender. When you obey and surrender, great blessing come upon your life. When we don't, there are consequences either way. One is good, one is bad. God wants only the good for you. You were created by God for God. You are created to be part of the body of Christ. And you are created to serve in the body of Christ. I'm just the messenger boy. It's not my message. It's the message of God. we got to put aside the things of this world. He's coming soon. We'll be judged by Jesus by what we did for him, for the kingdom. Hallelujah. You're going to be found faithful. You're going to be found mighty and strong. You're going to be found fruitful before God. God's going to flow through you like a river. And the gifts of God are going to grow and explode in your life. And great shall be your influence for the kingdom and for the glory of God in these latter days. Hallelujah. Ooh, I 
I feel God in the house. Lord, you're doing a new work in all of us. A new work, oh God. A deep work. You're going to see the change. You know, I found with young people, they're looking for a challenge. Don't give them a namby-pamby. God wants to use you. You, Jason. Nations. You watch. You keep following him, you're going to be found yourself in nations for God. Harry, Myra, get ready. Greg Elizabeth, Dr. Josh, the greatest days are ahead for your ministry. Matt, get ready. You know, if you can make it back to your seat, that's great. We're going to receive our communion right now. I thank God for your obedience to come down. If you, you don't have to get up if you don't want to. We'll serve your communion on the floor. <laughs> Maybe a bit messy, but hey, we'll do our best. If you could just receive the communion of the Lord, we're going to have a communion, then we're going to go. Does everyone have the elements? If you don't, raise your hand. They'll give you one quickly. Ushers, hostess, we've got some over here. If you need one, take one. You say, we're doing communion every Sunday, every time we meet just about, because the devil's out there trying to take out people, and we're covering ourselves with the blood, making sure our hearts are right, and that the protection of God is all over us in Jesus' name. Amen? Is there anybody not? Uh, we, we need some up there in the balcony. If you tear open the cellophane, get the whole of the wafer. Let's go to God. Father, we take this represents your broken body. Represents your broken body. Lord, we've all been take, taking hits emotionally, mentally, physically. But you promised us that there's enough power in this broken body of yours right here. Symbolically, we hold in our hands that your broken body broke the bondage and dominion of hell. And we can receive healing to our lives. Physical healing can come even now in Jesus' name. Emotional healing can come even now in Jesus' name. His power is released as we partake right now and honor him with it. Let's partake even now. Let's take the wafer. The blood of Jesus is real. What you hold in your hand as you tear back the, the foil represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ washes us, but also is a protection. To protect you from everything the devil wants to throw at you. No plague should come near your dwelling. We put the blood of Jesus on your life and on your family. That the blood of Jesus washes away all guilt and shame. Lord, forgive us for sins, not just of commission, but sins of omission. Things we should be doing but are not. Lord, forgive us. And Lord, we forgive those who sin against us. We forgive each and every person. Right now, we make a choice. We forgive them. In the mighty name of Jesus, we receive your forgiveness and your cleansing. Even now, in Jesus' name, let's partake. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your healing power. Let's all stand to our feet, shall we? Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
mighty third person of the Trinity. Come like a mighty river, like a mighty wind, like a mighty wave. Touch each one here today in the name of Jesus. When they leave here today, may they leave with the presence of God on their life. May the favor of God be upon their life. Give them each an open heaven. May they have a supernatural week. May the power of God rest upon them. Change them from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. We give you praise, Lord, and honor in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. If you're first time guest, we'll meet you right. There's a thing, there's a reception area right by like this hall. Right over here, if you go down there, they will lead you to it. You get to meet the pastors. And God bless you. Have a supernatural day. Don't forget the magazine of the church. Amen.